everybody. Welcome to Nights of Halloween. Oh my goodness, what a week it has been here on Rock and Boxes Presents. Guys, guys, you know what? I don't even know how to introduce this wonderful lady this evening. Uh, you know, she's been in so many great movies. Roller uh -huh. Baby, uh, Maniac Cop 1, Maniac Cop 2, Terror Tales. Uh, please, everybody... Please welcome my guest this evening on Nights of Halloween, the beautiful Laureen Landon. Laureen, how are you? Welcome. I am doing better than most and not as good as some. Thank you so much for having me on your amazing show, Rock and Boxes Presents Nights of Halloween. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be a guest on your show. Thank you. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. And you know what? We are ecstatic to have you with us. And thank you so much. Take the time out of your busy schedule and join us. I, I know how it is for you guys. You know, Halloween time, it's crazy. Tonight, Saturday, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going out and partying. But uh, let's hope that we have the viewers. Let's let's go see. So essentially what I'm going to go do is going to go check out and see who is who and who is with us. Okay. But let's get right into it. So I don't even know where to begin, okay? I really, really don't know where to begin. Um, let, let's just go back a little bit and, um, you know, do you, do you mind telling you, – you're from Toronto and I'm from Toronto. Yes. So, you yeah. want to just give us a little bit of back uh, backstory of Toronto and where you ended up where you ended up afterwards and on and on, if you don't mind? Well, I was born in, I was born in Toronto and my mom was uh, from Poland um from Tornopol and she met my father in Toronto and uh they tried to get across the border for eight years uh, so that we could have a better life here yeah so um <laughs> uh, eventually they got across uh, went through the proper channels um and so here I am we uh, came to Hollywood uh when I was very young and then um uh, we moved to El Monte and I grew up in El Monte and went to Omani High School, and then uh, because I was always uh, uh, the kid in class that was always getting in trouble and goofing off and uh, the wild child um, and doing plays, I always wanted to entertain and, and I always wanted to improvise and just uh, make try to make people laugh. You know, my parents were divorced when I was young. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Dad kept going back to Canada, to Toronto. And I would go up and see him a lot, but um, he didn't come back down uh, too often because my mom was always stealing his money. So <laughs> it's true. And so he um, stayed with us off and on throughout junior high and high school. And then he stayed, moved back to Toronto and then to Vancouver where I would uh, go visit him. Uh, and then in Halloween of 98, I actually brought him down here because he suffered a cardiac arrest and um, was clinically dead for nine, uh, 13 minutes. He had a 13 minute downtime and then he came back and but he suffered encephalopathy, brain damage. And so I brought him down here and, and, and took care of him. Um, so, you know, that's how I got to Hollywood. Wow. That's an incredible story. And uh, so have you been to Toronto uh, a lot since? Well, I was there a year and a half ago, and first of all, I was there five years, five, six years ago for the Masters of Horror episode of Pick Me Up um, with Michael Moriarty, who I absolutely adore, and so um, the interesting thing was um, I was, the hotel I was staying at was right across the hospital from where my father had his open heart surgery, and I had fallen in love with the cardiologist, Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, who saved my father's life uh, when he had the cardiac arrest. Because at first my dad was in Burnaby General Hospital, and then I had him transported by ambulance to um, St. Paul's Hospital. And they wouldn't do anything uh, about a surgery, saying he was, he was a cabbage. They kept calling him a cabbage. But this amazing cardiologist, uh, you know, he fought for me, and I myself went to the head of vice president of the hospital and threatened the vice president of the hospital and said uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I had done a lot of research about uh, cardiomyovascular uh, research and so forth and from the Texas Heart Institute. And the vice president didn't know if I was for real or not. And he, he asked me what capacity I was in. 
And I said, it doesn't matter. It's not important. What is important is you, is you take care of my father and get him his 08 Jess. And so um, ultimately he said, I have three daughters of my own and, and I wish to God I have a, had a daughter like you. So my dad got his OHS and then Halloween, Halloween of 98, I snuck him across the border. Oddly enough, it was Halloween of 98 and then I, and I took care of him. Um, and so did my sisters, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't know, so you, you, you might not remember Toronto because you left at a young age, but it's certainly changed in many years. With all those condominiums downtown Toronto and everything, it's crazy. Yeah, I was born on uh, Avenue Road. Are you familiar with Avenue Road? Absolutely, just north town. That's north, uh, north, north of Toronto, just like north of uh, Bloor. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. know exactly what it is. When I was when I was at TIFF, uh, Toronto International Film Festival, about uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, we were screening my. Uh, premiere of my my film Sky, which is on Netflix right now, uh, with Diane Kruger and Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. Uh, there were fifteen hundred people there, and uh, we got I got a standing ovation for my performance in that. And the, the funny thing was, I was staying uh, the hotel I was staying at was right across the hospital from Toronto General, where I was born. So that was quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I go there now and then. I, I'm starting to wow, it's starting to come what out. Happened? What happened to you? I don't know. I scratched my forehead while you were speaking. Sorry, hun. Oh my gosh, I don't know. And it just, yeah, it's okay. I'll I'll be fine. Looks like you need stitches. Uh, at some point, I probably might. Yeah, it's okay. Oh Okay, I, if I start to fade away at the end, don't worry, we'll be good. So uh, let's continue on. Maybe I'm having a brain aneurysm. I don't know. It's something like it's just like starting to burn out, but that, that's good. That's okay. So um, let's go back a little bit. We have a lot of people on here that are watching. And uh, and last night you were talking to one individual. His name is Tampa J, and he's in Florida. And he, he said he had the biggest crush on you. Uh, when he watched the Maniac Cops, I guess, as uh, as he was growing up. Right here behind me. Can you see it behind me? Yeah, absolutely. The Maniac Cop, too. Yes. Can you see the poster behind me? Oh, yeah. See I see that, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. He, what do you mean he had, as in past tense? He had well, I don't, wait. Uh, well, he just said he had the biggest crush on Lorene after I watched the Maniac Cops. He was talking to you last night, so I'm pretty sure yeah, that he <laughs> I remember we were we were making plans for the future oh. while Jimmy was talking. <laughs> I'm being so facetious. Hot. I'm joking. Please tell him hi, Tampa. Yeah. Jay. Is it Tampa J, eh? Tampa. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he he says he can't stay. I, I I think he has. I'm sorry, Sean. I have to go. I have a Rocky Horror Picture Day, a Rocky Horror Date tonight. Oh, come on. This is okay. your Rocky Horror. <laughs> That's okay. It's ladies. Uh, where is he in Florida? It's, what, what time is it there now? It's Can't, our time. It's ten o'clock. It's it's nine thirty. Yeah, nine thirty-eight. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. So party time. Uh, go ahead. It's party time. It's of course it's party time. It's party time. Uh, so anyway, um, let's go a little bit. Let's go back a little bit and let's talk about the uh, a couple of the movies that you did that yeah. I really remember. Uh, as a kid, you know the boxes, you know the v VHS and the and the Beta Max, the Beta Max tapes and everything. Um, you mean before your parents were born? Somewhat, yeah, in the 1800s, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about all the marbles and and, and working with Peter Falk and and uh, you know and Burt Young, um, you know, and and also answer this: Did you get any wrestling uh, coaching? Oh my gosh, yes. We uh, trained with Mil Mildred Burke. She was a wrestling champion, <clears throat> excuse me, for many, many years. And um, uh, they had seen, I don't know, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm You're fine. bleeding again. I, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, it's okay. I, All I'm right. Good. Anyway, we, there were two things. Uh, Robert Aldrich, the uh, director, uh, at MGM, he directed uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, The Dirty Dozen, The Longest Yard, hundreds of the greatest movies of all time. And when I met him, I didn't know who he was. I was 20 years old. And I said, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Altman. I thought his name was Robert Altman. And he <laughs> laughed and he laughed. And I thought something was showing. And 
And he said, no, my name's Robert Aldrich. And I said, who's that? Because Who? I'd only heard of Robert Altman. And then his yeah. son, Bill Aldrich, said, no, my dad is Robert Aldrich. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, later, later on, I found out after uh, who he was. So we went to wrestling school. Uh, they saw 2,000 girls. Initially, they tried to train girls, uh, wrestlers, to act, and they couldn't do that. So then they went after some actresses, and they trained us to wrestle for nine months, if you can believe that. Wow. Nine, nine wow. months. And then the actor strike hit for three or four months. and. Uh, Vicki Frederick and I were the only ones that continued to practice wrestling uh, with some tr uh, Mildred Burke and some uh, wrestlers she had from Mexico. Yeah, yeah. They were brilliant, uh, incredibly talented, and they were tougher than any of the guy wrestlers that were there training us. There were men and women, but the women, the women, uh, well, they made the guys look like sissies. What do I, what do you? What do you <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? You're yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I'm good. Don't worry. You keep going. I, I'm enjoying what you're saying. It's so good. And the brains are good, too. <laughs> Sorry. I'm good. What kind of brain? What brains are they? They're, they're, they're brains that I got from Tom Matthews, actually. They were sent up from, uh, you know, Midwestern states. And actually, they're, they're leftovers from last night. Would you like a bite? They're really good. Oh. No, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pass. No, uh, okay. I, I, ate, I ate a little while ago. A lot. Oh. I ate a lot, so thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm so good. So continue on, sorry. Oh, anyway, so they saw 2,000 girls, narrowed it down to 12, sent... Um, they screen tested 12 of us, okay? And then um, sent, uh, see, four of us to wrestling school. Yeah. They had a studio and Robert Aldrich and everybody, they sent four of us to wrestling school. And we continued to wrestle, but when the actor strike hit, two of the wrestlers didn't want to wrestle and because it was against the SAG rules. So, but Vicky and I did something rather duplicitous, I suppose. And we continued to stay in shape and to wrestle. Because uh, we we wanted those parts more than anything. Originally, Paul Newman was going to star in the movie, um, and at the last minute, he backed out. And I'm not sure if it was the color of money, but they had the beginning. Paul Newman was going to star with us. Was this lead? Uh, was Harry in the movie? So uh, when Peter Falk uh, got on board, uh, we were really surprised and. Uh, I was I was happy because I just I couldn't believe I was in a um, major major studio film um, directed by one of the greatest directors of all time. So that's fantastic. Talk a little bit about uh, Burt Young. I love Burt Young and always the Rocky movies. And you know he was a he's a gentle kind soul. He was here in Niagara Falls, and too bad I missed him. But uh, could you talk a little bit about him as well? Well, he was very um, compassionate. He was very giving. He was very um, uh, rustic. He uh, had no arrogance, no attitude about him. He was incredibly funny. He had a <laughs> daughter. He was single at the time. Um, he was he was absolutely lovely. And I ran into him at uh, Chiller Theater a couple of years ago. Yeah. And. He was. <laughs> you're so funny. He was. Uh, he was there, and he got up from. He was signing autographs, and he got up and he came over and he yelled my name. And, and we took some pictures. Great to see. You. I'm sorry. I. I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> starting to go again here. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So, um, can you hear me? Unfortunately, yes. Oh my gosh! All right. No, I'm, 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 I'm gonna need stitches for this soon. Um, so let's talk about Roller Boogie, and uh, you know, tell tell people like, did you uh, were you a good roller skater before? You know, roller skating was my thing. I loved roller skating, not roller blading. Roller skating. I'm talking old school now. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to the eighties, yeah, since seventies, whatever. But um, being that we grew up rather indigent, you know, uh, we couldn't afford expensive uh, sports and so forth. But you know, we could get uh, got a pair of roller skates from the Goodwill and or Salvation Army actually. And I love skating. I could do axle spins, and I used to uh, skate at flippers all the time on La Cienega and share had a, uh, a rink out in Reseda that I got invited to every Monday night. Jack Nicholson was there. Uh, the Who's Who was there. Uh, I would always skate in the middle and do axles and back and never fall. And a lot of people there, a lot of actors there wanted me to teach them how to skate. So, um, yeah, I, I still love roller skating. I roller skate in, um, in uh, Sky, actually. I made my own skates, but I never got to wear them because Diane Kruger loved my skates. It took four hours to, uh, you know, put the rhinestones and the hearts and the crosses on them. So, so um, she wore my skates in the movie and whatever. And so. whatever. Oh, that's cool. And you yeah. also you also worked. This is the second part of the question. You also worked with Linda Blair. Oh my gosh, we got you got to talk about The Exorcist when it's like Halloween, but. Linda Blair, she was also on the film, and, uh, you know, with all these horror films, um, uh, you know, what, what was your thought of The Exorcist anyway? I mean... Well, at the time, at the time, I was not allowed to see it. Um, okay. My mom and dad would not let me see it at all, but, uh, yeah, of course, eventually I saw it, and I thought it was... Um, well, I, I felt it transmitted signals of excessive violence, and... I, th I thought the masturbation scene with the cross was uh, absolutely despicable, um, but that was the script, and I'm sure that's what attracted everybody to the movie was going to see that scene. Uh, yeah. I thought she did a phenomenal job, um, an unbelievable job. And, and I talked to her on Roller Boogie a few times, but she was very busy trying to learn how to skate. She was doubled a lot in uh, all the... Uh, skating or axles that you see. Uh, it was not her. Uh, Jim Bray, who was a professional skater, did all his own skating, but um, uh, she was doubled. Yeah, she was doubled and all the fancy stuff uh, you see in the distance. That was one of the first things I ever did. And I was just a, you know, a skater in a pink outfit. That's all. I don't, didn't have any dialogue or anything like that. But yeah. she was cool. She was really cool. Yeah. And you know what? What's that? I see her at autograph shows, and oh, yeah. she's very pit bulls, rescuing pit bulls, as I am. I rescue pit bulls. I have pit bulls, and um, but I think that's her life's journey right now. Um, I'm not sure if she's acting anymore. Are you, do you know if she's acting anymore? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, she's really doing the activist thing. She was here in Niagara Falls about a year and a half ago or something. But yeah, the. Um, yeah, she's really into that. Uh, you know, she she really doesn't like the proclaim the flame of the, uh, you know, the she'll sign autographs and she does it for the shows and whatnot. And she was also, she had roller boogie stuff there as well, I, I'm pretty sure. But, uh, yeah, she's really into that, uh, you know, go to the, you know, her her website and help the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And at the end, I want you to tell everybody where, where they can find you uh, with respect to that, if there's anything you want to share with anybody to uh, you know go out there and, and help pit bulls for sure. Oh yes, uh, the the rescue before I, in case I forget is called circlel.org. It's in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, Circle L, Circle of Love. It's called Circle K Ranch. Circle L. Um, that's an uh, unbelievable place to rescue pit bulls and also all kinds of dogs, not just pit bulls, uh, but mostly pit bulls because, you know, that people dump them off all the time and don't want them. Uh, and the, the thing that people don't know about pit bulls is they are the most loyal of all, all dogs, and that's why they are so protective of their owner. And <laughs> you got a bloody nose, pal. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. It started. I just gave you one. Oh my God! I I I'm hanging in there, Lorraine. Oh, we got Lorraine. Hang on, she's a little. Bit... Yeah. Oh my God! I know. So... How can you see with all that blood? Uh don't worry. It'll it'll be better later. I'll be able to see perfect. So uh, <laughs> so uh, 
So let's let's <laughs> let's talk a little bit more. Somebody asked about Airplane Two, and I want to know how did you get the role? Um, I slept with the director. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you guys are getting kids. Look at that. <laughs> what happened was I had just done all the marbles, I the jury, and the uh, producers at uh, was it? Paramount. Paramount. Yep. Um, called my agent, B. Kellen Jennings, and said they wanted me to be in the movie. Um, and so I met with uh, one, uh, what's his name, Howard something, I don't remember. And uh, the director, Ken Finkelman, um, and they hired me. I didn't have to read or anything. And I made so much money. It was insane. I worked on it for three weeks. And, you know, it was an ensemble cast, so everybody was in, in the cast. So um, they shot enough for three airplanes, to be honest with you. I don't know why they never made another one. Uh, I still believe in my heart that the uh, first one was the best one of all. Well, oh yeah, for sure. But you were great in, in Airplane too, because, you know, growing up as a young kid, you know, these are movies, you go to the theater and you start, you know, th these, this was com comedy from my genre, my days, my, you know, and it's, I'm so, I'm so happy that you're sitting here with me. It, it, it's amazing. And I can't wait till we get to do a sit down one day. We'll, we'll, we'll have a blast. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, also now we're going to 1988, and I uh, want to talk about Maniac Cop in 1990. Uh, tell us what it was like to work with Bruce Campbell, as well as uh, you can touch on Robert Dobby, who was my first interview, uh, first celebrity interview. But uh, yeah, and it was also written by your very good friend Larry Cohen. So let's talk about Maniac Cop. Yeah, um, Larry Cohen is my best friend for 35 years. Yes. Um, we write together. We have the praying mantis. Can you see the praying mantis over here? Yes. That's a comic book. We made it into a comic book. Can you see it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a comic book, and we have a, a very, very interested uh, publisher from the UK. I wish I could say his name, but I can't because we haven't signed anything. Okay. But he wants to publish it in January sometime. Mm -hmm. So. Larry Cohen and I wrote this, and as you can see, the guy, the uh, praying mantis, has carbon fiber legs. Yes, I and see that. That was my idea, and so was the concept, actually, because at the time, Larry was, and I were going to see Stan Lee. We were going to see Stan Lee uh, to pick some of Larry's ideas, and I said in the kitchen when I got to his house, I got this crazy idea about a praying mantis. Um, he said, what? what? What are you talking about? I said, well, how about we have this guy, uh, he's in the war, he loses his legs in the war, and he comes back, and he's a priest, he loses his brother uh, in an IED accident, and he comes back to, I don't know, say, the most crime-ridden city in L.A., which is Washington, D.C., which we based it on, ultimately. By day, he's a priest, you know, he has no legs, he's lost his legs, and he feels sorry for himself, and he has this antediluvian cathedral that he, he lives in, and he lives in the bottom of it, kind of like Batman. And at yeah. night, um, well, during the day, he, there's all these people complaining, 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 and there's no justice for all these things that are happening. The police won't do anything. There's, you know, a lot of injustice in the criminal justice system. So what he does by night is becomes the praying mantis. So... And Larry had the character uh, design, had my facial features. I, I am Susan Humphreys in the book. It was not my idea, but Larry insisted with our graphic illustrator, Ron Randell, and, and all the people that worked on it. So um, it's an amazing story. It's incredibly funny, patriotic, and we are so proud of, of that. That's awesome. And so what about Maniac Cop? What about it? A maniac. Cause I'm a maniac. Maniac, yeah, we're all maniacs in our own way, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, I had done uh, all the marbles, I the jury airplane to in in uh, Israel, and so Larry asked me if I wanted to be in uh, Maniac Cop, and I said yes because I wanted to, and um, I liked the script because um, um, I don't know it, you know it, it didn't. 
it was horror, but it didn't have all the graphics uh, things in it that a lot of horror movies have. So, uh, and it was a great character. I got to play a detective, which was a departure from some of the roles I played in the past, like a wrestler. Um, um, no, I played a detective in I, the jury, opposite Armand Desante. So, yeah. Uh, you're playing too. I played a bimbo in that. Uh, I haven't played many bimbos in my life, though. Thank God. <laughs> even no, though I am. Roles. Even though you've had some great roles. But uh, I, I didn't mean to be rude. I wanted to know where can we get that comic, by the way? Oh, it's. I only have, have one copy, and I sent it to the publisher. Oh, okay. uh, I sent him a digital file, and I, I also okay. I just sent him the book. He saw the digital file. He loves the digital file. He loves the praying mantis. He was blown away. I uh, can't say who it is. Uh, lovely, lovely man. Incredibly intelligent. He's ma just been making movie after movie after movie, and he happens to own um, he happens to own a publishing company. So um, I don't know. Just through social media, actually. Uh, uh, he found me, and uh, and I told him about this comic book that Larry and I had done, and and he wanted to see it. So I sent him the digital file. He was blown away, and so we'll see what happens. I'm very Larry Cohen and I are very very optimistic about it. We have had a couple of offers uh, from people uh, to publish the comic book, but we are um, extremely. Uh, careful and we just weren't really happy with the uh the work i guess you could say the work of the people uh that we had seen does that make sense yeah. um uh, and larry's very specific um i'm not i am too but not as specific as larry uh he knows what he wants he knows what he's interested in and the passion that this and enthusiasm that this company has for the praying mantis uh is what really inspired us to uh, go with go with this person. So, yeah, and and I guess I guess with all the blood, it's making me dizzy. So I guess really what the que when the question what the question was was when would it be available? And I'm sorry about that because this. Just, uh, <laughs> Are you okay? I'm fading fast. <laughs> You're crazy. Um, it, well, we, there's only been a few copies made. Okay. Uh, maybe yeah. four copies made, signed by Larry and myself. So they're really collector's items. And to be honest with you, I gave them to my family. Um, I just gave them to my family and one to a very, very close friend. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll know more in January. That's all I can say. I, I can't really elaborate anymore, but I'm extremely proud of this mm -hmm. comic. It's incredibly patriotic and uh, very funny, too. And... Nobody's ever done uh, uh, the praying mantis, and uh, you know it's licensed and copywritten and everything. So don't bother to steal it, anybody, in case you want to. Uh, <laughs> somebody already did. A very close friend of ours stole the carbon fiber legs and used oh. it, and used it in one of his movies uh, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's all right. Oh man, uh, yeah, that's all right. That's Hollywood. Yeah, that's Hollywood. So talk a little bit about Hundra. Let's hear about Hundra. Oh, yeah. really I, got to, I got to go to Spain. I got to do stunts. Woo. I got to fly. Well, I hated flying. I was comatose the whole time I was uh, on the plane because I was terrified of flying. Um, but um, we were in Almeria and Segovia, the, uh, the same places that they shot Conan. And yep. I, had, I had the most incredible time of my life filming uh, Hundra and I got to do all of these stunts in the film and there's talk of a hundred too I've met with the director Matt Simber who created the character and uh, there's talk uh, by quite a few people actually about hundred too where I have a, a daughter now my age would be my age right now so it, you know we'll see that was the greatest time I ever had in my life, and it was also the worst time of my life. That's well, you know. Sometimes, sometimes the good way better than the than the bad. I guess sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so with all these fantastic movies that you've done, I mean, 
you know, uh, are you are you a fan of movies, of horror movies especially? I mean, you do a lot of horror, so or you've done, you know, are, are you, uh, not horror, but uh, I'm not uh, maniac. Uh, I'm not horror, but into, um, I am I am doing uh, California Coven that I'm the executive producer of and starring in. It's yeah. about witches, uh, basically a care facility that is run by witches that are trying to raise Lucifer uh, from the dead. And another movie called Go Straight to Hell, excellent. Um, it's about a, um, a bunch of women that are in purgatory, and they have a guide that is showing them all their past sins that they did. Yeah. And the sins are so heinous that the guide has to show them and they're all, all four of these characters are in denial about what they did and lie about what they did so i play the mother of one of the daughters she's a soap opera actress who puts me in a uh care facility uh, uh and, and goes on to mexico to make a big movie but what happens in the hospital the reason i chose this part because they gave me a choice of the parts to play and the reason i picked the part of Lacey was because it is something that I can really do a lot with and improvise and uh, a tremendous range of emotion is involved because she is practically raped. She is uh, so many hor horrific things are done to her in this basically dungeon uh, yeah. is presented as a beautiful care facility like most are today. And, you know, Scott Sanford is the Director, uh, writer, amazing job writing. I'm very excited about that, and also being able to produce, executive produce, and produce, uh, so I can have a say in what what is going on, um, as opposed to not having a say uh, into what's going on. Uh, recently, something happened where I was supposed to star in a movie, and and. I'm not going to go into it, but it was pretty horrible what happened when I was, I was signed to do the movie, going to do the movie, and then they had a uh, change of heart at the last minute. So, and plus they wanted me to rehearse a lot, which I would not do at all. Uh, it was a sad movie, and um, you know, once again I go back to this town, and you know, I'm grateful to work in it, but there are so many fraudulent, phony people in this town that. Uh, pretend you you are their friend. Tell you you have the role to your face. Read with you. Tell you you have the role. The producer tells you you have the role. My agent made the deal before I went to Austin, and then everything fell apart after that. So, you know, I'm very skeptical of this industry. So that's why I'm producing now and executive producing. So I'll have a say in what I'm doing. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I guess my question really was, I mean, I was going to segue into it. The terror tales, yeah, uh, sorry, night terrors, and then terror tales. So talk a little bit about um, that, and then I also want to talk about um, the, the nation's fire with uh, uh, Bruce Dern. So if you can tell us, so let me see. First off, talk about night, night terror. terror. Yes, night, night terrors came first. It's directed by um, a very talented uh, young man named David Maccabee, and. It's, it's, uh, the, what I got from it was whatever happened to baby Jane and I'm this uh, over the hill actress and I have this daughter who is constantly having these frightmares, uh, horrific nightmares, frightmares and I dismiss her existence and all I think about is myself and uh, in the meantime she's, she's uh, becoming what she's dreaming and you know um, anyways winning uh, almost every award that David Maccabee and uh, enters the movie in the festivals. So I'm very happy for him. Yeah, and now let's uh, talk about, uh, well, do you want to come back to Nation's Fire and Sky, or do you want to talk about Terror Tales? What do you want to go with first? Well, I'd like to talk about, well, I'd like to talk about Terror Tales because that came before Nation's Fire. And yeah, okay. Well, um, I work with this director. Uh, thank, thank God for my amazing, uh, incredibly compassionate and kind and loving and honest operative word here is honest manager and his name is Joe Caleb Williamson and I've never had a manager like this in my life uh, who has watched over me made sure I, uh, nobody took advantage of me and um, he got me this part 
they wanted probably they wanted somebody else uh, a bigger name I'm sure but uh, ultimately I got the role and the funny thing is when I when I met the director uh, I first of all I read the script and yeah. I was I was amazed by the ability that this director who I hadn't seen had the um, ability to create suspense and tension through the proper timing as I read it and and also um, just he knew how to manipulate your emotions uh, that's all I can say about the script and it was an anthology. It's an anthology, you know. And his name, but and don't sue me. I'm not. Don't send me to Wickenburg with Harvey Weinstein. Um, um, he was so young that when I saw him, I thought he must be the grandson of the director. Oh yeah, but he was the director, and I think he—I think he's 32, maybe. He looks uh -huh. like he's 15, and his mind—the way his mind works—and uh, when he films, uh, you can just get the sense. You get such an adrenaline rush, okay? Um, you just get an adrenaline rush watching him and how his mind works. You had him on last night. You heard him talk there of how how in how off the charts he is he's as, as smart as Larry Cohen is and I never say that about anybody but he to me is going to be the next master of horror and he's just astonishing and gentle and kind and giving and you know we talked about the part the character and so forth and I had brought I, I told him about something I wanted to do because uh, basically the story is about a guy, a psychopath who abducts a husband, and the the family is in um, an attached trailer in the back, and the psychopath has a button and is going to blow up the back, and he predisposes the lead guy, the uh, uh, the the husband, to three tales of terror, and Lynn Lowry is in it. I've only seen clips, and she is astonishing as always, and. Uh, Jonathan Tiersten plays my son, which is kind of weird, but he plays my son, and I play I play uh, the mother of Jonathan Tiersten, and I'm trying to throw off the detective that keeps showing up to the house, so I came up with some ideas that I'm not going to go into because I don't want to spoil it for the uh, audience too much, but I came up with an idea to make me so crazy that the detective wouldn't think or know that my my son is in the basement because he's trying to go through the house and and he sees that I couldn't have the rationale or logic uh, to be so manipulative because I made her so insane or tried to anyway. It, so. it, sound, it sounds like they're coming after you, the cops there. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> they're, they're playing my song. <laughs> <laughs> so you spoke about Jimmy Lee Combs who we had last night who was an honor and a, oh, it was amazing to have him on. Isn't he? Isn't he? And, and so humble. Let's see oh, how long that lasts in Hollywood. But he's so, in, he, he, he'll stay the same, I'm sure. He's coming to AFM next week, and I hope to get to see him. Um, I'm working on my projects right now, um, but I, I will, will make time to go, if, I, if, if I'm allowed, to go to see, uh, see him at uh, AFM. And I definitely want to support him for this amazing film, that uh, this anthology that he wrote and and he said last night his favorite uh, um, uh, episode is the radical video episode in the anthology and because of his love letter to the 80s right what are you doing uh, I'm just <laughs> taking a shot of some blood that I it's been dripping oh. off my face so yeah see it yeah. looks like you're wearing lipstick I got I am ah. anyway um, no. Sorry. You know, the thing about the thing about horror that I love, and that most people I think love, is that when people watch horror, their heart heartbeat increases uh, by 15 beats a minute, and the blood pressure spikes, and it's an adrenaline rush, and I, it's really no different than I would say a roller coaster, eh? A roller coaster where you know it's a it's a rush, but at the end you know you're going to get off, and you're going to be fine. 
but I love horror movies, horror movies going back to Frankenstein, all uh, the famous icons, you know, because those were the ones where they pursued, pursued you and the chase was on and that was so terrifying, the chase. Uh, unlike today where, uh, well, back today they focus less on suspense of the uh, chase and more on the suffering of uh, the victim, yeah. right? Yeah. From my experience in watching horror movies, which is, you know, but th that goes to uh, society. That goes to show you what um, the audience is desensitized to. You know, they want more and more and more and more and, you know, more and more graphic uh, detail and so forth. So I don't know how I got off on that. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I'm starting to really, uh, but, you know, the, the movies that they make today, you know, you're right. They chase the, um, you know, the victim, and they, they, they focus more on what the victim is. I remember seeing Frankenstein as a kid and the monster's face being shown for the first time, and I was like, oh! Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. And God bless my mom. God rest her soul. She's no longer with us. But I remember her grabbing my head and turning me away from the television. Oh, my God! Ah! You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Dracula. And, 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 and Dracula and the Wolfman and you know, all the great icons, you know, uh, back then. And they withstand the test of time. And they go up to what Jigsaw today, Psycho today. Um, but uh, it's, the, it's, it's so graphic. Everything nowadays is so graphic. Uh, yeah. As opposed to in the past is what Larry Cohen always uh, did with his movies, horror movies. Not that he did many at all. He's, he does suspense, uh, suspense thrillers. Yeah. Uh, if phone booth, cellular, uh, bestseller. Um, he's got some incredible projects coming up with one of the biggest, the biggest producer in Hollywood right now. Uh, can't, I'm not going to say, even though it's all over the internet, I'm, I'm still not going to say who it is. Anyway, oh. um, so yeah, I like the, I love the old movies. Like I said um, earlier when uh, we spoke very briefly, uh, the day the earth stood still. And the original, the original, The Thing, with James Arness, which was in black and white, uh, and Black Christmas. Did you ever see Black Christmas? Oh, absolutely. Of course, with Margot Kidder, it was one of my favorites. And uh, I got to meet Margot here in Niagara Falls. Oh, uh, you did? When? When? She was fantastic. She actually was here for, like, uh, the Superman anniversary or something. But And it, she was great. And we spoke about Black Christmas. And I remember how... Frightened I was from that movie. Oh my god! The eyeball, the, eyeball. the guy in the attic, you know. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, that was so scary. And what's scarier um, is what's I, to me is what's left up to the imagination. Um, mm -hmm. Always, what's left up to the imagination because we all have a fear. I think all we all have the same love for horror because we all have the same fear, ultimate fear, dread of death yeah of death. absolutely you know what i'm you know what i'm saying uh we're that mortal fear of death which is inevitable um but and going into a theater when all the lights go out and you see these images come on the screen and you know it's terrifying but at the end you know everything's going to be okay but still in the back of our minds and mine anyway is you know ultimately we're gonna die, you know. So at some point, you know, that, that, that's really about yeah. Yeah, no. Like I, tonight, <laughs> I'm coming to kill you. I'm I when Jerry gets back or whatever, I'm gonna ask him for an ambulance because oh my god. <laughs> you look awful. You look horrible. <laughs> what a mess! What a bloody mess! Yes, so I wanted, to mess. Know, <laughs> I wanted to know about the character from uh, Terror Tales. You know how grueling you guys shot that in Colorado, correct? You guys are were in Colorado for a period of time, and yeah. how grueling and mentally, you know how mentally, how grueling mentally was it to play the character, Miss T? Well, um. I had talked to Jimmy about it back and forth in emails uh, for a little while, and uh, he, he, uh, I told him this idea that I'd come up with to throw the cops off that I mentioned earlier to you, to throw yeah. the cop detectives off when they showed up looking for the sledgehammer, my son, a serial killer, who was in the basement at the time. So I said I'd like, I'd like to come up. I have a, I have a creature, that 
I want to believe is alive. And I don't want to say what that creature is because it'll blow the movie. You know? No. But I have, I have him right here. Yeah. This, is, this is measles. Say hi, measles. 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 Say hi. Say hi. He hurt his foot. Hi, puppy. Hi, puppy, puppy. Say hello, to measles, everybody. <laughs> all the, all the watchers, all the viewers. Oh, so many kisses. I <laughs> got oh, it. So many kisses. I oh, got it. Ha ha. Kisses. Oh. This, anyway, this is measles, and and he's shy. So are you shy? Yeah, he doesn't. Anyway, I'm gonna put him back in his little bed right now. You okay? Everybody's saying hello to measles. Hi! <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so, all right. So you were talking about, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave the character for another day and uh, hopefully, you know, when, when everything's said and done, we'll find out exactly what you're talking about. And uh, yeah, you guys all out there, you guys, you're gonna have to, you'll get it all from here and, and we'll be spreading it all over, spreading the love all over the internet whenever this whole thing is said and done. Um, <laughs> So I have a couple of questions for you that are just kind of like, uh, you know, about who you are. Um, you know, your sense of humor is awesome. Like, you have a fantastic sense of humor. And, you know, this we're This is Josie all... Kong. Yeah. This oh! Is, this is Josie Kong. Cool. Josie Kong, we have, a, we have a black kitty named Josie. You do? This is Josie Kong. Say hi. Is Say that hi. A, how old is Josie Kong? She's three. She's my, three, two and a half. She's my assistant. Yeah. Oh. She just came to jump on my lap. Oh. She's camera shy. You have Josie too? We have a Josie too, yeah. And a Sasha. Both uh, both sisters. Black cats are beautiful. Little yeah. Kids. They're I older. Have... They're older, but I love them. So, so my other cat's in the other room and, and that's um fearless fearless kitty. She's fourteen and she's not she's you know she's yeah. uh taking it easy. Yeah, these, these kitties are fourteen, uh thirteen or whatever they are as well. Um, so your your sense of humor, let's talk about that. I've watched you in some interviews, and you just come off with the most wittiest stuff. Where does it all come from? And, you know, my, my dad. Come? Your dad. Yes, my father. My yeah. father had the most incredible sense of humor of my dad. <clears throat> and my, my dad, um, just uh, as poor as he was, he... He uh, always made everybody laugh and, and made it a point to get everybody's name that he ever met and to make them feel special and to make eye contact and make them feel special. I, I uh, got my sense of humor from my father, Douglas Coughlin. My real name is Lorene Coughlin, not Landis. Coughlin. Oh, my gosh. That's the character from uh, uh, Cocktail, Douglas Coughlin, who yeah. is uh, the protege or uh, – Tom Cruise was his protege. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. My my. Well, my dad was way before that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. That's where I got my sense of humor, and wow. from and from Larry Cohen, because Larry Larry has um, uh, uh, a ridiculously wonderful sense of humor too. Uh, most people don't don't know that about Larry Cohen at all. They think, oh, he does horror, he suspends, you know. But uh, Larry cannot say a sentence without making you laugh. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, I get that. That you've said that a couple of times behind, like when we spoke. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to meet Larry. It's going to be great. Um, so someone asking here that say, uh, <laughs> what what genre or project uh, you would you want to do that? For whatever reason you haven't had a chance to do yet. Okay, I'm a screenwriter as well, eh? So yeah. I I have four scripts um, uh, ready to go, and the one I'm most passionate about is called Jailhouse Dog, and basically what it's about in, in three sentences or less is putting uh, rescue dogs that would otherwise be uh, uh, predisposed to euthanasia into a prison environment. And the dogs rehabilitate these surreptitious, uh, subversive inmates. The dogs rehabilitate the inmates. And it's called Jailhouse Dog. And it's ready to go. Larry Cohen and I wrote it together. And it's a passion of mine. Um, he's got his projects, uh, of course, 
great projects. Um, but the, you know, I have I have four or five screenplays right now that I want to get out there. That I'm, I want to get out there. But um, if I had a lot of money, I would make uh, uh, Dog Pen. It was initially called Dog Pen. Yeah. Uh, penitentiary dog penitentiary dog pen yeah yeah and 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 there's a lot of subplots going on and the guy that runs the prison is a loser and he's an idiot and he's uh constantly compromised and be made a fool of by these inmates right and one day he has to bring his dog to prison because his wife dumps him for the prison chaplain lester the molester so he has to bring his dog to the prison they steal his dog and they fall in love with his dog when he get, demands his dog back. He can't find it. And all the inmates love the dog, and they demand their own dog. So what does he do? He looks everywhere. He finally finds a, a rescue. This crazy girl, Rochelle, who I, you know, with these red hair extensions, and she's crazy, uh, absolutely off the charts, insane, and obsessed with rescuing, rescuing, rescuing. And so he and her... Uh, bring the dogs into the prison environment, and um, like I said, the, you know, she stays and watches and monitors what's going on because she doesn't like this guy that's running the prison. She thinks he's a, a lunatic. He's just stupid. And ultimately, they fall in love. Uh, but there's so many plots, subplots going on. But that—that that is my passion is rescuing. And I'm so happy to see last week California is the first state in the union to pass the law. Um, where dogs, uh, uh, puppy mills are no longer legal in the United in California, and you cannot buy a purebred at a uh, store anymore, um, and that goes into effect January uh, 19. Yeah, January 19. Uh, wish it would go into effect sooner, but um, uh, I was that made my year when I saw that that California has banned uh, selling uh, purebred dogs and i cannot emphasize enough people please go and rescue don't breed for greed rescue 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 because if you if people would please go look up the horrors of puppy mills what really goes on at puppy mills yeah. you would never ever ever go and and go to a a, a place and get a dog a puppy you wouldn't do it and there's oh. millions of dogs you know there's only there's only five thousand uh shelters in the united states and there's a, uh, something like 1.9 or 2 million dogs and even more cats that are home, that uh, they're trying to shelter that don't have homes. So if you do the uh, math, 5,000 shelters for a million, nine or 2 million dogs, you know, so many are one and cats, cats are even triple that. So I, I just uh, hope people will rescue and, and don't breed for them. I don't know. I'm just passionate about that. You've got a lot of uh, people out there that love exactly what you're saying. And um, this gentleman, his name is Corey. He's oh, in. I love them too. He's in. I love them too. He's in Atlanta, and he all of his dogs are ha were rescues, and uh, are or was this? Uh, hang on, this was. Uh, yeah, I believe that was. Uh, anyways, I'm sorry if I mixed that up, but someone said that they've rescued their dogs, and then. Um, the other question was: Was what breed of dog would you want to use in the in the in your idea of the film? Um, I had a rescue dog in uh, in a dog pen or jailhouse dog. I had a rescue dog that is a uh, English English uh, bulldog because uh, it was so weird looking, but it was a mix. It's a mix. The dog that I saw that I want that I wrote about was a dog that I had actually seen in a rescue place, but. Now, because I have such a, a, a deep love for pit bulls and all dogs in general, I would probably, I would probably make that dog uh, a pit bull mix, a Staffordshire Terrier mix. Um, I love all dogs, mind you. I'm just partial to pit bulls because when I go to the shelters, I percent of the shelters falls. Yet to go in a cage, and I go into a lot of cages. They let me go in the cages. I've yet to go in a cage where a pit bull has bit me, attacked me, or or tried to take me down. They always back back off, and they're terrified. And that just breaks my heart. That just really ah. breaks my heart. So, Absolutely. yeah. Can, but there's can all you... kinds of dogs in dog pen. There's all kinds of dogs. You name it. Uh, they're all rescues. They're all unwanted dogs. They're all... 
mixes. They're uh, Dalmatians, you know, Dalmatians are the one breed that goes to the shelters the most. You know why? They're too anxious, the, mo the most anxious, highly high anxiety dogs of all. People get them because they're cute little puppies like how, how. But then they, awesome. then they take them back to the shelter because when they're grown up, they're so hyper, yeah? But they're so cute when they're little puppies. And so Pitbulls and Dalmatians are pretty primarily, uh, from my experience, uh, from going to shelters, are the main dogs that are in the in the shelters. But there's all kind, there's all kinds of dogs waiting and kitties waiting for somebody to come and love them. I mean, Josie Kong, who I named after Joe, manager Josie. Oh, Joe. Joe. Okay. Yeah, incredible, wonderful, loving manager. I named her after Joe. After Joe. Uh, he rescues too, and I, I uh, have I have more respect for people who rescue than I do for anybody uh, that I will ever meet in Hollywood. And I knew Marlon Brando very well, and I used to call him Pop. But I have he rescued too. Marlon Brando rescued uh, Bull Mastiff mixes and uh, Rottweiler Slubba, and that was my dog and Christian Brando's dog, who was my boyfriend for many many years. And but uh, yeah, I have more respect for people that rescue than I do for most human beings. To be honest with you, no, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's just me. Though. That's just me. I, I know all the people out there that have pure bad. Hey, hey, you bitch! I, oh. you bitch. I don't care. I don't care. I'm at a point in my life where I, you know I'm a woman who says the words she feels and not the words of one who kneels. I don't kneel anymore. I used to kneel. Uh, not like not to Harvey or people like that, but ever. Oh. But you know what I'm saying. I hear you, honey. I hear uh, you. Yeah, <laughs> I might. I don't give a crap. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. Um, so I'm not letting you get away without talking about because we got a little off topic. For that's okay. Yeah, that was great. I, I love to hear about because I also rescued a, a Jack Russell a long time oh. ago. Me and my my ex-wife. Yeah, beautiful little dog. We called him Rambo because he was so Rambo. But um, we had to kind of wait, let him go because our son was born and he went at our son and we couldn't have, you know, uh, our son was only brought home from the hospital. So he was had that jealous. So we found him a really good home. Uh, we, we had to screen people, but um, and it, it, yeah, it was quite the process to find a really good home for our loving little, I miss Rambo. He was a great little dog. Rambo, what a great name. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so like I said, you're not getting away without touching on um, the uh, Nation's Fire. Nation's Fire. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. What about it? Well, we wanted to know about it. Tell us a little bit about Nation's Fire and working with Bruce Dern. And, and, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, what happened was there is this director who I have the most respect for. His name is Thomas Churchill. And I call him Sir Thomas Churchill because uh, he's directed Lazarus Day of the Dead and Checkpoint and a whole bunch of other movies. And he is um, an incredible human being, not just a great director. He wrote the part for me, the part of Myra. And I play, believe it or not, I play uh, the mother of the lead actress. Um, well, you could believe that, obviously. but. Uh, her name is Krista Grotta, and she is phenomenal, and she is breathtaking. And I told her, "You look like a painting. If I was, if I was gay, you'd be in trouble." And she is impossibly beautiful. And she was uh, the star of the movie, and um, uh, she was in a biker gang. Got a, uh, ran a, uh, runs a tattoo parlor, is on the ins and outs with her father. And I'm a drunken uh, tra trailer trash train wreck in the movie, Myra. Oh my I, played, I played Bruce Dune's wife in, in the movie, in flashbacks, actually. Tom Proctor plays my uh, current husband, but in flashbacks, uh, Bruce Dune. And we improvised all our scenes, Bruce and I. And Bruce said to me, and I'll never forget this, he said it in front of the entire cast, he said, uh, Lorene, there's only woman one woman I've ever worked with in my life, in my life, that is a better actor than you. And that is my daughter. 
if there is anything I can ever, ever, ever do for you, I want you to let me know. He screamed this in front of the entire Universal people, the reps, the cast, the crew, the managers. Um, he just said that. He said, the, uh, the only actress in your age range that is better, uh, at that, in your age range, uh, there, there's no actor in your age range that is better than you that I've ever, ever, ever worked with in my life except for my daughter and I'm sh and he meant Laura Dern of course so that was quite the quite the compliment and anyway um, Chris DeGrada's character um, has this son Tommy and she's madly in love with them and every time she comes to pick me for me comes to see me to take Tommy to school I am of course you know and you know I have one or one or a hundred too many and she's out of her mind uh, which was a stretch so I play this crazy, psychotic, uh, drunken uh, lunatic, and I hate her guts, actually. I despise my daughter because she's everything I always wanted to be and never was. That's she awesome. had an education. She's smart. had no education. So Chris DeGrada, look at me, and please go give her a page of like. She is astonishing. I can't say enough about Chris DeGrada, really. That's that's fantastic. So um, and also, uh, Chris DeGrado. Uh, Grada. You DeGrado, you talk so highly of people, and that's what I love about you because you work with some really fantastic people, especially on the Terror Tales. You know, yeah. like I met Felissa Rose, uh, Ari Lehman. Ari Lehman's going to be here November twenty fourth. Um, I will Thank definitely. You with Ari. Um, it was an anthology, eh? Omnibus. So. We all uh, worked at different times. Uh, I've only seen excerpts, but I know Ari is an amazing talent. So, yeah, and of course we're going to have Ellen Udi on the show tomorrow, which oh, uh, really the excited. bomb. No wait, 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 she's the bomb. And you think I'm crazy or funny? Wait till you talk to Helene. Oh my gosh! <laughs> we did a show last year um, uh, for David De uh called "A Husband for Christmas," and she just knocked it out of the park. She's a phenomenal actress and a good soul. I think she's Canadian as but, well. Oh, yeah, no, she's from Montreal. So would you say that the expression, like the crazy Canucks, like we are the crazy Canucks? Like when yeah, they we are. We are. <laughs> and we say, a, we say A because B was already taken. That's but, right, baby. You know, that's right. So, all right, let's talk about your Netflix uh, sky. Let's do that. Talk about Netflix with Diane Kruger. Yes. Um, Tell people about it. Okay, I uh, I did that about uh, two years ago now. Just came on Netflix. Uh, not that I don't know. Maybe a year ago or eight months ago. I don't know. Uh, but I play uh, Charlene. She, I, I'm a bunny girl, uh, a wackadoodle bunny girl on the Vegas Strip. I love playing severely flawed characters three-dimensional characters that I can do something with. I get a lot of scripts sent to me, but if I can't do something with the script, with the character, then I, I just, you know, I, unless, unless I can do something with the character and make it my own or do something that people will remember, then I just pass on it. But this role was just fantastic. And, um, you know, I'm Charlene, a, a girl, a wackadoodle bunny girl on the Vegas Strip. I have Elvis in person. In person personators on either side of me and you know she, and I roller skate in the bowling alley which I didn't get to do in the movie I mean I did in the movie I roller skated a lot in the movie with my own skates but Diane, Diane, and I skated backwards 100 miles an hour and the funny thing was when we were filming uh, in Vegas one day shooting uh, I was skating backwards as fast as I could and the streets were blocked up but somebody forgot to check for potholes so as I'm as as Diane saying her character Romy says says to me, oh my God, you're so wonderful, you're skating, you uh, um, uh, Charlene, you're such a good skater. And I said, oh, I was Miss Kansas City bomber, you know, I I was Miss Kansas City bomber, and I won every award. And at that second that I said that line, oh, I, no. I hit a pothole that was about five inches, four or five inches deep. I hit the pothole on the line. I went flying in the air, flying backwards, and I landed on my head and my back, and I just laid there in shock. And they all came screaming, screaming, running over to me, and 
uh, oh my god oh my god are you okay are you alive are you alive and i sat up and all i said was did you get it on film <laughs> oh we got it but we can't use it you'll sue us i said i'm not gonna sue you they said oh my god now that you're alive it's so funny it's so funny you're bragging about miss kansas city bomber and you're this and you're that and 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 you hit the pothole it was extemporaneous it wasn't planned um i really hurt my head uh hurt my back but i got up and you know and I skated some more, but uh, the wind was really knocked out of me. So um, when I went to uh, TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival, I asked them, "Is uh, did you leave that scene in where I hit the <laughs> pothole and went flying? And the director said, or producer said, no, uh, we had to cut it out. We, we, we cut it out. I said, can I have the footage? Uh, no, nobody can find the footage. Oh, geez. That sucks because, you know what, that probably would have went viral. Like one of those viral videos, you know. Oh, my American gosh. Well, kind of they were, they, I think they were afraid, I think they were afraid of a lawsuit. Because uh, nobody, nobody could oh. find the footage, even though they, everybody was there that saw it happen. Um, I know somebody has the footage, but uh, somebody up there did make a comment to me, one of the producers, um, Somebody didn't want it, the director didn't want it, or somebody, maybe on, or somebody didn't want it in the movie because of a lawsuit. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I might sue. Uh, and I wouldn't, wasn't going to sue. I, would, I wanted to sue if they didn't put it in the stinking movie. Yeah. But <laughs> they took it out. Ah, uh, that's all right. I mean, Hey, let's say they, they probably have it and they, they're like, oh, well, you know. We, I was we, in the uh, movie a lot more. I was in the movie a lot, 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 lot more. Huge, I had a much bigger part. And unfortunately, uh, by the powers that be, an actress in the movie uh, had me cut out a, a lot of it. But the Hollywood Reporter says, if you go to LoreenLandon.biz, you'll see what the Hollywood Reporter said about my performance. Uh, and the, for me to repeat it is, bra is going to be bragging, so I'm going to tell you anyway. It's a, they say Landon's performance is so astonishing or something like that. Uh, so riveting, uh, so memorable, you wish the entire movie was about her. But anyway, I played a lesbian. Uh, Diane and I get together, and then for no reason, she comes and I'm with another woman, and we break up. It doesn't make sense, and everybody who wrote me that saw it says, there's so many missing pieces. And a very, very famous writer uh, from Variety wrote me on Facebook. And he said, if you repeat this, uh, I will never, ever, ever speak to you again, contact you again. You'll never hear from me again. But uh, you were absolutely the best thing in the movie. Astonishing, unbelievable, amazing. I could have watched you the entire movie, which is similar to what The Hollywood Reporter said. So. You know, I w I'm grateful that they said that. And I was allowed, they gave me the creative license, which I love about independent, independent films. Are you okay? Oh, I'm sitting here hanging on every word, honey. I love it. You, you, have, you have more blood on your face than you do skin. <laughs> you ever see Frank from... <laughs> uh, we're not talking about that film. We're talking about you. Who? Who am I? Who am I today? You are fantastic is what you are. Who am I today? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know today. I, you're Lorene Landon in my eyes. Well, I can barely see out of these, uh, this one especially. Uh. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, my dear. This has been so much. You know, I'm telling you, this has been so entertaining and so amazing. I really do. I, I, I could oh, talk, good. I, for one of I, us. talk with you. Pardon? I oh, yeah. Good for one of us. Oh, yeah. There you go. Look at that. Oh, there you go. Now you're talking. I'm going to my party now. All right. So I'm going to let you go after this one last question. Um, you know, we, we were talking about the paranormal. and. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. How, how, how do you, do you like investigations? And yeah. obviously I know that you do uh, believe in it. So let's talk yeah. just quickly about it. Okay. Give us your take on it. I'll take my sunburn off. Um, wow. Okay. 
I live in a house that was built in 1904. Yeah. Okay. I can't say the name of the house because I have stalkers, okay? Yes, and, no stalkers. Yeah. Anyway, it's a green and greenhouse, and it was built in 1904, completed in 1905, and it's haunted. And when I, when I, moved, when I came in, when I walked through with the two, uh, the realtor and the broker, we, we walked through one of the rooms up here upstairs. I'm upstairs in my room. But one of the rooms in the back, middle back, uh, the air felt like it was pu pushing down, pushing down, pushing down really hard. And I said to the realtor, did somebody die in this room? And the realtor said, why? And I said, somebody died in this room. And he said, nobody, no, no. And I said, oh, yeah, somebody died, somebody died in this room. I can feel it. And he says, well, by law, we have to tell you the truth. Somebody did die in the house. But the person died in the front room, which was this room I'm in now, which is uh, two bedrooms that have been broken down into one. It's a, you know, it's a craftsman, massive craftsman, craftsman house. And he said, no. The, the person that lived here before died in his office, which was the front room, this room now, which is two bedrooms, really, uh, an office and a bedroom. He said he died in the office. I said, no, he, he died in this room. So I said, no, he died in this room. So six months goes by. His brother from Hungary comes, and he wants to meet the new owners. And he says, he says uh, I said to him when he came to the house, I said, um, Jacques, can I please take you upstairs? And he said, sure. I said, I have a personal question to ask you, and would you please follow me upstairs? And he said, sure. And so we walked upstairs to the middle back room. We call it, I call it the spirit room. And I said, D did uh, your Martin die in, in this room? And he said, yes. Wow. He says, how did you know that? I said, well, the air don't you feel the air and he said no i said don't you feel how warm this room is and it was winter and he said no i said was there a bed here facing on the wall a little bed he said yes there was a little bed i said when he died did his head land right here right here on the ground i made a circle and he backed up and he said nobody could possibly know that Nobody, nobody knows that. Wow, that's incredible. And I said, he's here. And he said, is he happy? And I said, no, he's not happy. And he said, he never found the love of his life. He was gay, which is fine. Yeah. I, all, everyone I know is gay. Who cares? I love gay people. Uh, of course. And he said he never found the love of his life. And he was very very deep which I had already said and I said he asked me not to smoke in the house he said he hated smoking and I said well he's asked me that and I said I don't smoke in the house because once in a while I'll smoke once in a while uh, don't do much of anything else like sex but once in a while I'll have a cigarette whatever and um, so there's a drawbridge going down to the basement right yeah and and it's a drawbridge like something out of England. And you can only open it by pulling on a lever, a weird rope lever, and this drawbridge opens up, right, like that. It's so bizarre. And all this creepy stuff has happened. I've seen white flashes of light going through the house. So has Addison, the guy that lives here, that lives with me. He's seen it. And, uh, Oh, we put giant bells on all the doors downstairs and all over the house, right? Yep. One night, Addison's always gone uh, because he works for Humana, and he's, he's a director, and he works all the time. And I'm always here by myself, but I'm, uh, I live in no fear. I'm in no fear because I know Martin Wilde protects me. And also I have Moses and measles. Oh, yeah. And the gizzard, who's sick, very sick. Oh. That's that's all right. That's you know we choose to surround our lives uh, with those that are shorter than our own, but we would certainly have it no other way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, unbearable the gaps are, uh, but we still would choose to have it no other way. Anyway, uh, so there's bells on 
Christmas bells on all the doors. And so many times I have in the middle of the night heard the bells ringing, 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 ringing. And run, ran downstairs and one, one or two, two times I've seen a white flashing light like a star, a starburst halo go right through the house and through the window and out the door that time. And another time I was asleep and Moses, who sleeps with me, was growl, growling and growling. And I heard the drawbridge to the basement opening up. Wow. It, it opened up. And it was, it's always closed with a bell on it because there's an outside door where somebody could get in. Even if you put on a, well, a lever to lock it, somebody could maybe break the door. I don't know. But I heard that drawbridge open. I was sure somebody was in the house. And wow. Mo Moses was growling and growling. And he came down with me. I was terrified. He was out of his mind. He ran right to the basement. The door was, basement door was wide open. And I felt this strange presence, like, I don't know how to explain it, like this heat, heat passing through me. And then it was gone. But it wasn't the light this time. It was just heat passing through me and gone. Maybe it was Marty and went back upstairs. I don't know. But a lot of crazy stuff has happened here. Um, and a lot of people have, have wanted to come uh, and bring their paranormal equipment, eh? Their paranormal equipment uh, to see if their spirits. I know Marty's in the house, Martin Weil. I know his spirit is here in the house. And it's not a bad spirit, like I told Jacques, his brother. It's a, it's a very good spirit and a caring spirit, uh, but a very, very sad spirit. It's not a malicious ghost. There, he is, there is a ghost here, Martin, but it's a good ghost. It's a protective ghost. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, wow. I, you know what, Lorreen? I could sit here all night again and, and talk with you and talk with you. You've done so many wonderful things. Many but you have to go to the hospital and get stitches. Absolutely. That's where I'm going right after this is done. And uh, so I want to thank you so kindly again for taking the time to come on the Rock and, rock and Boxes. I can't even talk anymore because there's so much blood that it's like making me, I told you, it's making me dizzy. <laughs> and everybody that's joined us this evening has thanked you and said, you know, what an awesome interview. And thank you very much for everything. And I would love to have you back at some other point. There's other yeah. projects that you're working on there's other stuff that you're doing and you come back here anytime to promote whatever the heck it is you're doing you've been a joy you've been a pleasure and and god bless you you've been great um, thank you to everybody who has said nice comments or even bad comments probably but thank you to everybody who has commented and who has watched the show i i don't know who you are and i uh i wish i did but um i'm on facebook so Please friend me on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm I'm really on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook anymore. There's too many crazies on it. I mean, there's <laughs> nice people, but there's a lot of crazies on it. But Twitter, um, plus I have 5,000 friends on, on uh, Facebook, and um, I only know three of them. So, so no. My best, my best friend, Lisa. I want to say hi to my, my sister, my love, my life, Lisa French. She's my heart and soul, my my rock, my best friend, my bestie of all time, Lisa French. I love you. I adore you. Oh, that's so great. So I'm going to say, you know, on behalf of Tribulation Studios, which I give a huge shout out to Jerry Potter and his tireless yes. efforts all week long. Amazing, amazing job Jerry Potter has done. He's absolutely the most creative, the most brilliant brilliant editor I have ever seen in my life and even Larry Cohen said he's astonishing and made and Larry Cohen even called him Larry Cohen who calls nobody unless it's about work or his friends close friends very close friends or his wife Cynthia who I adore um, he made me call Jerry Potter he made me he made he made me show him the video <laughs> times, and he said to me Get on the phone and call Jerry Potter. I want to talk to him. <laughs> and he's never said that. So wow. I love you, Jerry. Oh, wow. There you go. That says something from my partner, Jerry, at Tribulation Studios. Like I always say, be good to one another, guys. Love one yeah. another. I'm going to go yeah. take care of this. I'll be back tomorrow with 
Ellen UD at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Rock and Boxes Presents. Tune in, subscribe, hit that bell like I always say because it'll notify you when we go live. A last word from our beautiful, amazing guest. She's got to go to a party, guys. Lorene Landon, give it up for everybody. And uh, one more word. Love, love, love and rescue. Rescue, rescue, please rescue. And thank you, Tribulation Studios, Rock and Boxes presents. Sean, thank you for having me on your amazing show. And put some ice on that. You know, you know why they don't, uh, well, why does a Polak put ice in his condom? Oh, that's a good one. I don't know why. To keep the swelling down. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for watching, whoever watched. Thank you. Friend me on Twitter, Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, Facebook, whatever. Facebook. <laughs>